Pittsburgh Steeler fans. Welcome back to another episode of Steeler Stat Geek. This is behind the steel curtain deputy editor Dave Schofield coming at you. And for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see I am here by myself this evening. Uh, my big brother, Rich, who usually joins me. I mean, actually, I think this is only the second show he hasn't been here for um, since he started joining me during the bye week during the last, during last season. Um, and that, and that other one was the, was the second show at was the next show after that, but, uh, he's on vacation this week. And I know you're probably saying what in the world can you do on vacation, uh, during this quarantine time? And that is a great question. And the reason, and you're, and you're probably saying, okay, what's he doing? Well, he takes a vacation so he can stock his freezer with, uh, with fish for the, for the year, is part of what he does with his vacation time. So he was out. I'm pretty sure he was out on the lake this evening and he was coming in um, from that. He will actually be joining us for the second show. So I, I am alone on the screen, but I am not alone talking about Steelers. As Erica said right here, you are not alone. We are here. That is correct. And that's, what's nice that I can still be here with you all. Now, it's a possibility he could jump in before the end of the show. I told him he didn't have to rush. I understood. Um, I, I know he's more than 100 miles away, but I don't want to smell fish through the computer screen. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, that was a really bad joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, So it's just me for this show. But not only for the next show, are we going to have Big, uh, Big Bro Sco joining us? We're also going to have someone else on the next show. Um, and that is we are going to have one Brian Anthony Davis joining us this evening because at the suggestion of Darren Dalton last week, he threw out he threw out a, a suggestion of saying, hey, why don't we do, rather than figure out the all-time best Steeler team ever, why don't we do the all-time worst Steeler team? Not like the, not pick a year that they were bad. It's, the worst players at each position over the years. And I said, and Rich and I started talking about that. We thought that sounded fun and funny. And we said, if we're going to do that, we got to do it with, with, with bad. We got to do that with Brian Anthony Davis. So I said something to Brian. He's like, he's in for it. So that's going to be tonight. That's going to be the second show, the, the stat geek Q and a, we are going to look at the, uh, our all time worst Steelers teams of all time, which with Brian, that should always be, a whole lot of fun. So we'll get into the criteria and all that whenever we start up that show. But for tonight, we're going to keep going through. And I say we, that means you all and myself, although you're just going to have to listen to me talk a lot. We're going through the Steelers draft picks. I like what Jefferson Hartman decided to do on Thursdays. He decided to that we're going to go in reverse order because everyone else is going, going forward. So for Stat Geek, we're going forward. On the Steelers preview, we're going in reverse. We're kind of, we don't exactly meet in the middle because it's an even number. For those of you stat geeks out there, you now know that uh, we're not going to be doing the same player at the same time, except actually, I think we probably will because this Thursday we will be, I don't know that we're going to get around to highlighting our draft player because we will be having a very special Steeler schedule release party Steelers preview show. That's what we do. Uh, they usually do it on a Thursday. I, I, when they said May 9th was the date, I kept saying in my mind, I think it's going to be the seventh. They generally do it on a Thursday. Uh, it's, um, I, who was it? it might, I don't know if it was Dale Lolly or, or another, if it wasn't Dale Lolly, it was another one of the, of the Pittsburgh beat beat writers that said, you know, it's before it came out, there's like, you know, it's going to come Thursday. Uh, they don't want it on a Friday or Saturday, which is your news dump times. So um, you, you kind of want to have that. So then you have Friday to talk about it as well. So they have all kinds of good stuff there. So we're going to break down the schedule on Thursday. We're going to go through game by game. I know last year we went through game by game and we – we gave our prediction uh, with the Steelers record with a game by game. Uh, really looking forward to that. I'm getting, I'm getting ready to have an article for tomorrow. Uh, I, I don't want to sound, I really don't want to sound like, Oh, what was me too bad. I'm a season ticket holder. But when the schedule release comes out for a season ticket holder, it's a whole different ball, you know, ball of wax there because 
as a season ticket holder, as a fan, I want to see the Steelers playing on Thursday at home because it's hard to travel on Thursday. The odds are stacked against you. We saw what happened last year when they had to have the short week and had to travel. Um, I still think a lot of what happened in that game was because of the lack of prep time that they had, uh, bar, you know, minus the incident at the very end that was going to happen. Just but let's not go into that one. Let, yeah, let's steer clear that one. Um, I also also you like those those Monday night home games because the Steelers are so successful on Monday night. As a season ticket holder, I want all their primetime games to be away because it's just it's it's I, I instantly have to say either everything's up in the air for me uh to go to the games, which this year everything's up in the air anyway, because we still don't know how that's going to pan out. So that's all with with fans and everything else. Um but the other thing is if everything's normal and they're playing in full stadiums, it's just it, it makes it a lot more difficult on the fans attending the game. I love what I would much rather watch a primetime game at home than than go to the stadium. But it, then the problem is your tickets and everything else. So it's just one of those things. So um, just to, there was a question real quick, um, that I wanted to bring up before we moved on into the topic of the show. Uh, DJ 2YT, oh, is it Tonely or T only? I don't know. Uh, when is the NFL supposed to give detail about the schedule and travel this year? You know, the schedule drops Thursday. They plan to tell us about travel plans. We, you know what? They're not, unless they announce it during the show that there's like, that could be part of the show, but we don't know. I haven't heard anything that it would be about discussing what are the contingency plans. Bottom line is this. The NFL is in the best situation when it comes to getting back to life and sports because they're going to see what happens with the NBA. They're going to see what happens with the NHL. They're going to have other things that are looking to do stuff with their seasons before we even get to the NFL. Um, I know I'm a season ticket holder, but I'd much rather have games played in front of empty stadiums than no games at all. Um, I would be okay. As long as they don't charge me for tickets, even though I have the seat license, I'm okay if I don't have tickets to games this year, as long as the Steelers get to play. So there was an early report when it came to the schedule that they were going to try to adjust the schedule to where if they had to miss games or various other things that or shorten the schedule, it, it would happen easily. Um, I don't know what, exactly what that looks like. If they don't say it, that's going to possibly take me trying to dissect the schedule and all the teams and say, oh, they're doing this, so they could cut out this, this, and this, and that would still work out okay for everybody. Uh, we do know that they're not playing in any international games this year. That's already been announced. That's that they're playing all their games in the United States. So the Steelers weren't going to be one of those teams because of all the various things that have come out. Uh, the, there were a few teams that knew they were playing overseas but didn't know their opponent yet, but they weren't teams that the Steelers were playing this year. Or it was someone like Jacksonville that they already specifically announced that the Steeler game would be in Jacksonville because that's a highly coveted game for people in that area. So – I don't know how it's all going to work out. Um, it might be that they have games and they have fans, but they can't go full capacity. I think a lot of that stuff is going to iron itself out in the next few months. The other thing that I don't know about that's a great question is, when are they going to sell tickets to games? Are they going to go ahead and sell tickets to games and then have to refund money if there's a problem? I mean, I just had um, I had tickets to a show. Uh, for this summer that just got canceled that I I'm going through the process of, you know, that order being canceled. I had another, uh, it was actually supposed to be a couple weekends ago. My, it was my wife's Christmas present to go see a comedian, uh, Jim Gaffigan, in case you guys were wondering, he's, a, he's really funny. Um, but it got pushed to November and things like that. So all these, do they want to deal with that hassle or do they just want to say, we're going to wait and not sell our tickets until later on? I'm not sure what they're going to do. I know Kathy's asked the question of if there's no fans in stadiums, how do they make money? The answer is, the answer is, that's not where they make a lot of their money anyway. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, if, I mean, think about it. That's that is a lot of money, but they also get a lot of money from TV as well. So 
it's one of those, and that also brings in implications if they're not playing in front of fans or in front of full stadiums. Um, is it going to hurt the money intake to where that's going to affect the salary cap next year? That's a that's a good question. Um, so that it's just it's just one of those things. Cree brought up something that he heard. And this is speculation, nothing official, but this is one of the things they could do. I heard they will try to do all interconference play at the beginning of the season and all conference play at the end. So in other words, then it would line up perfectly for what I said. I My prediction was the Steelers were going to open this season at home against the Redskins. Um, if, they, if they have the four games like that, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I don't know if that's it. Are they going to do, or are they going to do three divisional games to start the year? Because they would rather teams you know, since you play a team twice, why does it matter? You know, maybe that's the first games they want to have to where you don't play home and away against your division, or maybe it's the other one. There's a lot of different things. And Thursday will probably give us more than anything. Uh, Mark Davidson from down under says, I think the hall of fame plans will be postponed. Um, here's the deal with Jeff Hartman had an article about this on the website today of a, they have, I think he said five different contingency plans of how to do the hall of fame and the induction. It could be if the NFL has to adjust their preseason schedule because of everything with COVID that they could even play the hall of fame game later in the preseason. That's was even one of the, one of the things. And there's also a lot of things of not having the hall of fame game. And they've had years that they haven't had the hall of fame game during, during the lockout. They didn't have it. They didn't have, I can't remember the exact, it was the year at, I'm pretty sure it's the year after um, the turf at the stadium ruined Sean Sweezen's career that then they didn't play the following year. Cause the, the turf still wasn't any good. So we'll see how that all plays out. But if you're curious about that, go to behind the still curtain.com. Jeff Hartman had an article this afternoon about that very thing. So, so let's see, let's go ahead and jump into the topic here. I'm just going to do some things. And if we have some time, since it's just me, I, uh, maybe I'll even turn over to the live chat specifically about this topic. As we go through players, we're going to the second draft pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers, which was a third round draft selection. Once again, this is going to be pretty interesting for the Steelers and Steeler fans. Last year, Deontay Johnson was a third-round draft pick, but for a lot of Steeler fans, he felt like a second-round draft pick because he was the second player they took. Alex Highsmith, I mean, he was a third-round draft pick. Not only was he a third-round draft pick, he was a third-round compensatory draft pick. The Steelers didn't have their third round pick because it was part of the Devin Bush trade. And of course they didn't have their first round draft pick because their first round draft pick is Minka Fitzpatrick. So they, they draft Alex Highsmith. Now I went, I wanted to have time. I didn't have time to go back and listen to it. I am fairly certain it might not have been specifically for the show. It might've been one of the other times I've done it. Cause I saw his name several times that he might have been one of the players available when we did our mock draft on the Steelers Q&A the Tuesday before the draft in the third round. I had always kind of dismissed him because I don't like to take flyers on small school guys that I don't know about, but I love it when the Steelers do because I know they've done their homework way more than me. So if the Steelers like a small school guy, that kind of like that kind of gets me to like him even more. Um, I try not to fall in love with the small school guys just because of the question marks. And I don't trust my judgment um, as much as I do the Steelers. So that's that's what's going on. He is the third round draft pick just before the fourth round started. Alex Highsmith out of UNC Charlotte or when they just call them, when they announce stuff, they just say Charlotte anymore. Um, hasn't been, hasn't had a football program for that long. They were in the, let's see, when did they start? What was it? 2013, maybe. I think they started a football program at the school and they were FCS for a couple of years and then bumped up to FBS. They're part of Conference USA. And that's the biggest knock on Highsmith that people don't understand or don't, don't know how it's going to translate to the NFL was he was a, he's from a, a smaller conference, 
but the Steelers love those small conference guys, especially the Mac. And um, he had a lot of production, but he was a walk on, wasn't even a scholarship player to start. Um, so, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Here was his statistics from his last year of college. And those are the most important. So I'm just going to go with that. He had 75 tackles, 15 sacks. Like a lot of people have been reminding Steeler fans on Twitter. That's only two sacks less than second overall pick um, Chase Young out of Ohio State. Now, granted, there's a big difference between Ohio State and and um, and Charlotte, but also at the same time, when you're playing for a big school like Ohio State, um, you can't really focus in on one great player because you got mul- you usually have multiple great players on the defense. Where uh, Highsmith was definitely the cream of the crop at his school. He had 21 and a half tackles for loss, three passes defensed, and two forced fumbles. So that was his stats last year. So in order to figure out what we could maybe expect for him this year, it really comes down to what is his role. And his role coming in is exactly why I wrote an article before the draft and said, Steeler fans need to be prepared for this, for the Steelers drafting a linebacker early in the draft. I felt that the Steelers would address either the inside or the outside linebacker on day two of the draft. They didn't have a day one pick. They had two picks in day two. I'm like, so many people thought the Steelers were going offense, offense, offense. I I was, I'm like, I wouldn't have even been shocked that they would have used their first, their, their first pick in the draft on defense for one of those positions. I like the way things played out. I like the way that they did that to get, um, uh, get a shiny new wide receiver. Some people like to say, um, that brings a different element to the Steelers that they don't have another wide receivers. So then they turn around and they took the outside linebacker. The case I was making was inside linebacker really needs some depth. They haven't replaced, um, you know, Mark Barron and all the snaps he took. I know Vince Williams will, will play more snaps this year than he did last year. Um, UG three. Lots of promise. I really like him, but he has zero defensive snaps in the NFL. So you've got to. So I wouldn't have been surprised if they would have also had another higher pedigree, which means draft pedigree guy that they got for this year. They instead they did the other option that I said was, and it was probably based on which which players were available, and that was don't be surprised for an outside linebacker because you released Anthony Ciccolo who was your main reserve. Your other two reserves are undrafted free agents. Tuzar Skipper has zero defensive snaps with the Steelers, zero snaps period with the Steelers in the regular season. And Olas is limited. So as much as we like them and we saw a lot from them in preseason, we still don't know what we have with them. And the other reason it was wise to where, the, where, where it was wise if they wanted to use high draft capital on an outside linebacker was that if you cannot work out a reasonable long-term contract with Bud Dupree, this may be his last year in the black and gold. If you draft a guy this year and have an idea of what he brings, now you don't have, now you, that, that helps you answer a little bit more for next draft year, next draft season in 2021 because you would know what you have in Highsmith, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, he doesn't have any other problems and plays a full season and all that other stuff. Uh, That's just kind of understood. So you know what you have, you know, if you have the potential to have someone that could be your, be your long-term answer there as a starter, or if you know that it's not working out, then you know, you have to address high invest high draft capital or a free agent at that position as well next year. So this was a great year, especially right when they did it in the third round. I think it was it was pretty wise with what they did. I think if there was a different inside or outside linebacker that would have dropped to the Steelers at 49, they might have pulled the trigger there. It's hard to say. We never know. I mean, as much as I like both Ola and Tuzar, we they they still are unknowns. So if Alex Highsmith has been called in to replace Anthony Ciccolo right now, you already got way better draft pedigree than anybody that was filling that role in last year in the, in last year or even before. If you look at the Steelers last year of their reserve outside linebacker, there were three players that played snaps for the Steelers at, 
at the outside linebacker position. Chicolo missed five games. He only played 11 games. He had 19 tackles, a half a sack, no fumble, forced fumbles or anything. Um, and he played 143 snaps. Then you had J. Roan Elliott, who was brought in for the Steelers. He played in five games. He had four tackles on 22 snaps on defense. Then you had Ola Denier, who he played all 16 games. He played more special team snaps than Chicolo because he was there for every game. It wasn't a lot. It was actually only three more snaps, but he was, he was contributing on special teams. He had in his 62 defensive snaps, he had eight tackles and two forced fumbles that were, that were accredited to him. So let's say, I mean, Ola might still have a role this year. Or he might not. Maybe they're going to use Highsmith just on one side and Ola on the other, depending on how it works. We don't know. But in all, last year, the reserve linebacking position had 227 snaps between all the players that did it, two forced fumbles, a half a sack, and 31 tackles. That's the kind of production that you're looking to have Highsmith replace. So now, now granted, like I said, got someone like Ola or Tuzar, whoever else is on the roster could also take some of these snaps as well. But remember two years ago, the Steelers went most of the season with only three outside linebackers. Anthony Ciccolo had almost 300 snaps that year. I didn't write this down. Um, and, you know, a little bit of better numbers than, than, than what he had, but he, he basically had everything. I think Ola had at the very end of the year, had just a, a handful of snaps. And that was the only other outside linebacker in 2018. So the Steelers are fine running with just one extra guy. And the question is, can Highsmith be that guy? If he is, that's going to give us more of an indication of his numbers. I thought it's kind of hard because him coming from a, a small school and a smaller conference I say smaller conference. I guess I should say maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not one of the you know the top five conferences, uh, power five conferences. Sorry, that's the way you say it. Um, but but coming from Conference USA, I thought was there maybe someone who had came out of one of those smaller conferences that was comparable? And oh my goodness, did I stumble across almost a great comparison? I know there's always Khalil Mack out of Buffalo, but he was drafted very high. Um, so that's not the as good of a comparison. How about this comparison? Let's see if anyone knows this in the live chat of a player drafted last year in 2019 out of Old Dominion, who was an edge rusher, one that even some Steeler fans wanted to see. The Steelers maybe look look into what what he was hoping maybe he would drop as a smaller conference, smaller school guy. Out of Old Dominion, he ended up going very similar to Highsmith. He was in the third round. He was the 95th selection overall in the NFL draft. And for those of you that might not know who I'm talking about, I am talking about from the New York Giants, and I'm going to butcher his name because it's what I do. I'm going to say, I don't know if it's O'Shane or O'Shawnee. Okay, I'm going to say O'Shane because I'm weird like that. And it's, I'm saying, I'm saying Ziminez. It's with an X. It's I-M-I-N-E-S. If anyone remembers him from the 2019 draft, which he was very interesting. So I'm going to say, because you know, a lot of times that X makes a Z sound. You could say it's Ziminez or or something like that. Yeah, good fellas had it. He said, oh, O'Shane something. <laughs> Yes, how quickly we forget that that was one of the guys on our radar last year. But uh, he played for the Giants this year, this past year. And he, now he probably, he, I'm telling you, he played more snaps than what I, what I project Highsmith to get. Now, if the Steelers suffer an injury at outside linebacker, then I could see Highsmith maybe getting these, this number of snaps. But, um, I'm going to still say Zimenez. I know I'm probably saying it wrong. Someone might spell it out for me. Um, he played 503 defensive snaps for the Giants this past season. So he played just over just around 40% of their defensive snaps. 
So if you look at that and his numbers, that could maybe help you know a little bit of what maybe we could expect from Highsmith. I mean, they're almost, look at this. Highsmith, 6'4", 242. Zimenez, 6'4", 252. They both played at Conference USA. Okay, they're both outside linebackers. Um, in Zimenez's senior year, and people are going to, it's going to drive you nuts if you know I'm saying this name wrong, and you keep hearing me say it over, over and over again. Um, in his senior year at Old Dominion, well, I think it was his senior year. It could have been a junior. I don't know if he came out early. I, I, I don't think he did. I didn't actually write down. His last year at Old Dominion, we'll say that. His last year at Old Dominion, he had 58 tackles. Highsmith had 75. He had 11 and a half sacks. Highsmith had 15. He had 18 tackles for loss. Highsmith had 21.5. He had two passes defensed. Uh, Highsmith had three. And he had the only the only stat that he had higher, he had four for forced fumbles where Highsmith had two. So if you look at it, they're very comparable to what they were in college, coming from the same conference um, and similar numbers with Highsmith having maybe a little bit better. So if you if we look at his statistics, it could maybe give us a hint of what we could expect from, from Highsmith. And in 2019, Zimenez had 25 tackles, four and a half sacks, five tackles for lost, one pass defense. That was his statistics. So if you look at those stats and think, well, maybe what, what about Highsmith with his rookie year? Maybe, maybe that he, he could bring something similar. Here's my overall projection before I turn it over to see what you guys are thinking. Cause like I said, I haven't been, been paying attention to the, to the live chat. I'm looking for him to play. If he's taking that role of Chickalo and he's getting it by himself for the most part with maybe just sprinkling in because sometimes I mean, there, there was some times last year where both Dupree and Watt were off the field. So there was two other line back, outside linebackers out there. So obviously he can't do that. He can't play both roles, both positions at the same time. Um, if he plays between 200 and 250 snaps this year, that would get that that would be a pretty fair estimate to think of, of where, where he could start. So if he plays about 200, 250 snaps, let's say in that he gets 20 tackles three to three and a half sacks, a pass defense where, you know, he, he knocks down a pass and forces a fumble. I would say that would be a very encouraging rookie season for someone who's playing as a reserve. If he gets, if he has to be pulled into starting duty because of an injury, then I could see that maybe even going up a little bit more. But I, I think he's, he's, he's a, high motor kid. He's, I say kid because I'm old and they're not. Um, and he's, he's known as a high character person was part of the reason that the Steelers were also interested in. So he's a high character guy, you know, high energy, high motor, lots of upside. There were some knocks on him about setting the edge against the run and how well he could do against the run. But if you want to know the truth, that's what they say about almost every outside linebacker coming out of college when they come into the NFL, that that's something they struggle with, which is interesting because believe it or not, that's actually one of the strengths I feel of Bud Dupree is that he does that, you know, probably, you know, better than TJ. So, so that's one thing that to look at with his game. But I mean, especially if you can say, Hey, let's put him out there on some, you know, maybe, you know, get, get Dupree a blow on a, like a third and long, put him out there on an obvious pass rushing play and just let him go. Um, or something like that. So, um, <laughs> it's funny because I just saw him pop up in the live chat. I haven't been paying attention, but, but Darren Dalton came in. Yes, we are doing your topic for the Q and a, it will be myself, uh, big brosco and Brian Anthony Davis all on the second show. So that should be a lot of fun, but to sum up everything with Highsmith, I think this is a great pick. I think this is a nice, let's just say this. Is it an upgrade from Anthony Chicolo? I surely hope so. I mean, if the, if the, 
one of the best things the Steelers had going for them last year is that they didn't is that Bud Dupree and TJ Watt each started 16 games. That's great because we know what happens in the NFL. Guys get dinged up, guys struggle uh, with getting on the field. I know there was some in-game injuries at times. I know TJ missed some time with an in-game injury. Um, and Dupree might have even missed. I think when Dupree had an injury the one time, he sat out maybe a series or two and then was able to come back. Um, I might be getting confused with another season. But none of the, all those guys started every game, which was good because did you really want to see them having to turn to Chicolo or J. Ron Elliott? I know a lot of people were excited about Ola, but, I mean, one of the biggest things that knocks against Ola is he was the wrong guy that was the wrong place at the wrong time to have a terrible flag thrown against him, which made it look like he – prolonged the drive for the Ravens to tie the game in week five. Um, really, he didn't He didn't do anything wrong. It was just an awful call. It is what it is. So what's interesting is you draft that outside linebacker. Some Steeler fans before the draft, even after, are saying, but our defense is so set. Heisman's going to see the field. Heisman's going to see the field. If, if the Steelers were drafted a quarterback there in round three, that guy was never going to see the field. So at least they drafted someone who, who yes, the defense is set, but he's someone who's going to see some snaps. And based on that, let's see what his kind of production would be. All right. So we're going to take um, between five and five and 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to have some very terrible grammar in the live chat to say, what do you all think? What do you all think about Alex Highsmith? What do you expect for him this year? If you want to throw out some any kind of stats, if you think he's going to fill what what kind of role he's going to do, um, what whatever you say, where I put that out there is when I'm going to start listen, uh, watching. So I'll get few as many as I, as, as I can. Okay, um, this is a good question. Dennis says, do you think the Steelers have him pumping iron? How much can he gain before camp? That's going to be interesting to know because it's not like he can be in the facility getting their strength and conditioning people. It would be through virtual stuff. Um, he possibly could get some, but that's that's tricky this year more than any other year. So I'm not sure. Um, doo -doo -doo. This is what uh, Lumberzak says. He's a developmental backup with huge upside. Yep, he's, a back, he's developmental, he's a backup, and he could be a starter in the future, but you're hoping he doesn't have to fill into that. If he has to fill in that role this year, it's because something went wrong, and hopefully that doesn't happen. Okay. Um, Logan says, excited to see how much he can contribute on special teams. That's the other thing, is that those guys, whoever's playing outside linebacker, when whenever they were active for games, they were getting special team snaps. So even if he's not in the rotation there, he will get some special team stuff to see how he can do there. Um, so that will be pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so let's see. Jerry Cherry says he'll get a shot up to him to make the most of it. Yeah, that's true. I think he's going to get an opportunity to play. Okay. Um, and he also, Jerry Cherry also added, he looks like he's going to crush people. So. <laughs> and then, of course, Creed says, does Highsmith get any plays at nose tackle to replace Hargrave? Everyone, it's so funny. Everyone so wants to replace Hargrave with, with, the, with the stereotypical nose tackle. But the problem is Hargrave wasn't your stereotypical nose tackle either. He was that guy that was also a defensive tackle. So it's interesting. But I do have a little bit of a nice surprise for you guys here for like the last five or ten minutes. What's up, bro? Hey, how are you? We're uh, I'm good. We are we are in the live chat with people throwing in their two cents about what they think about Alex Highsmith. That's why um, I wanted to that's why I wanted to jump on. I knew you were gonna be yeah. close to being finished, but yeah, because because I was all thumbs up on this guy. So yep. um I had heard a little bit about him before the draft. But mm -hmm. I got to look at a lot more stuff after, yeah. and oh yeah, he 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 fits. He's a stealer. You might know the answer to this question because I brought it up. Sure. 
And I wanted to listen to it, but I was too, getting too prepared for the next show to go back and listen to our show from several weeks ago when we did our mock draft. Was he one of those names that we had available in round three, but we're like, oh, that's a small school guy. I was saying, I don't like to take flyers and small school guys when, I, when I'm doing a mock draft because right. I don't know enough about them, but I love it when the Steelers do because they do their, they, they do a lot more research than me. Oh boy, there was, the, I, I don't remember if it was him, but you're right. There was somebody that we said yeah. that you were like, oh, let's thought because it's small yeah. school. And yeah. I, and i and this other person's available. And we took a linebacker in the first round in the, as our second round pick. Is second round pick. You're yeah. correct. We so did. we didn't, we took that hybrid linebacker that you didn't know if he was inside or outside out of Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too far behind on the live chat. I no, want to bring up on him. Um, Donald's that says, what about Christian Kuntz possibly you know, depth at, at outside linebacker behind Highsmith? I'll be honest with you. When it came to the depth chart, I didn't even list him. I put him as a long snapper because you want to know why? In the XFL, what position did he play? Long snapper. That's what they had him listed. I don't even know if he played outside linebacker in the yeah, XFL. But someone else might know the answer to that. I didn't watch <laughs> enough games closely to know. However, you know, think of Indianapolis right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know who their long snapper is? Um, you do it's not. It's a guy that plays something else, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. What, what yeah. What's He's his name? In, he was an inside linebacker. He played at William and Mary when I was there. So I saw oh, him that's play. Right. Yeah. I remember you saying that. And he had made, uh, might've been Indy's practice squad coming out of college and someone said to him, Hey, you know, if you want a better chance making the regular squad, why don't you get back into long snap? Because he had long snap when he was in high school mm -hmm. and he got back into it. And now suddenly he's the highest paid long snapper in the league. Because he got, can also act as a, because as a he, reserve right. Linebacker. Because he is a, he is a reserve inside linebacker. And, and uh, then he's a, he's a good asset running down the field on a punt. Because, exactly. Yes. <laughs> because he's a linebacker. Yes. Yeah. That's, so, that's good. You, you know, you, you say you didn't even put Coots in an outside linebacker, but if you can mm -hmm. get a guy as your long snapper who has that, that secondary that. ability to give you that backup in that position, save you yep. a roster spot that you can use somewhere else, why wouldn't you? I'm not, I'm not opposed to it, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I don't see Coots making it strictly as a linebacker. I think it would have to be he would be Correct. the long snapper I would and then could contribute there. Yes. I would agree. Um, George, George Rice wants to know, do we keep five outside linebackers this year? If not, who is out? I'm leaning towards saying we probably do based on how we drafted. I am leaning towards it because my general equation is nine linebackers. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you doing a lot of times it's been five inside and four outside, but if they don't have that depth at inside linebacker, right. it might, if it's only four inside, then it could be the five outside, mainly for special teams is anything else. Correct. So, mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Uh, Darren wants to know, Darren's excited because, because of the next show. Um, he says, which, which branch do you predict will have a bigger impact, the draft class or the free agent signings? Ooh. Bigger bit this that uh, my question back at Darren would be: Are we talking just this year, or are we talking overall? Answer both. Okay, I'm not going to get to his. I'm it, not going to get to his re answer. Right. He did it, if it. it's if it's just this year, I'm talking probably. I'd lean sixty forty to the free agents, yes. but if we're talking over the next two to three years, it's the draft class. I, I, that's that's the answer. I don't even know that I'd go 60-40. I'd go 70-30 um, with the guys that they have now because, I mean, granted. because sure, you're talking. I mean, e you're Ebron really talking. And was High Smith or what? Yeah. High Smith and Claypool getting the most. I think that's who's going to get the most snaps. Yeah. So with, with everything. Yeah. Um, so it's funny because we're still on the first show and we got people ready for the third show. You know, I don't yeah. even know if I should bring him up because Brian's here and ready to go, but we're still on show one. So um, here for the next couple minutes. So since Brian's ready, we, we might just have to have to 
uh, do this. Um, Logan one Logan had a good question here, and this this is probably gonna be the last one we do because we are we are needing to get finished up so we can get into the next one. Um, it's funny, all these popped right up when it was just me, but when there's two of us in here, it, it takes a while for these to load for me. Who has a bigger impact as a rookie backup, Highsmith or McFarland? Because we'll be talking about McFarland next week. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm, actually, answer, I'm, actually lead, <laughs> I, I'm actually leaning towards Highsmith because I think he potentially sees more snaps in the rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's my answer as well. Yeah, I had him pegged that if he's the if he's the main backup and outside linebacker, he's going to get between 200 and 250 snaps. Yeah. Um, a rookie running back has not that got that many snaps I, for the Steelers for a long time. Jalen Samuels had a lot of rookie, a, and I think his was like 200 and something, 220 something. And, and it's a crowded running back room, too. Yes, it's not that he can't contribute. I just don't know no. that he'll get as many. Snaps, opportunities to contribute. You know I mean. Yes. Okay. The 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 odds play in Highsmith's favor. Yeah, <laughs> the odds are ever in his favor. So, yeah. all right. You know what? I'm excited about this next show. For those of you that don't know what's going on, it's it's going to be um, myself, Rich, Brian, Anthony Davis. We are going to be answering Darren Dalton's question from last week of the all time worst Steelers team. Not the worst team. Not like, oh, man, that team from 1980, whatever, yeah. was terrible. Worst, worst We're talking the about the worst players at each position. We're, I'll, we'll lay it all out before. We're going post-merger. We're not going back to the 60s um, just because it's a, it's, it's a good stopping point. Yep. So, so we're, we're going to be doing that with the next show. Make sure, first of all, before you, before you get ready for it, go ahead and give the thumbs up for this one. That would really help us out. Make sure you are checking out behind the steel I already mentioned to answer a question earlier about uh, Jeff Hartman's article today about um, the contingency plans around the hall of fame and, and the ceremony and the game and everything else. But we've got all kinds of information there. Remember our other podcast, you'll have Jeff and Lance tomorrow night with the standards, the standard flagship. Um, podcast you'll have myself and brian anthony davis and jeff thursday night for a special what i'm fairly certain we're doing a special schedule release um show we have lance's yeah i said it we've got tony defio who did his um steelers brunch with tony last week he'll be back for his second show of that this saturday we've got homer and the hater on sundays and brian and tony for q a on mondays so we've got the whole lineup for you um so just make sure that you're 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 giving us the thumbs up if you can, you know, giving us a good review on the podcast forums, and more importantly, that you tune in, tell a friend, and subscribe. Thanks for geeking out with us.